so um, are there any questions from the last lecture? So we're in the middle of population genetics. I hope to finish it today. So no more sort of the mathy part of evolutionary biology. <laughs> um, not that you'll see any more math today, but you'll, all, you, all you'll see is in terms of equations is the Hardy-Weinberg, and that's, that's easy, right? Okay, so um, there, are a couple, there have been a couple of questions about notes that have been posted. I believe, I mean, I haven't put anything on B-Space. I mean, B-Space seems to become much more popular this year than it was in the past. And so I could, I'm certainly happy to post things there. It's not difficult, but they are being posted um, on the course website. So next to each lecture should be some links to my notes, a PDF of my notes, this bit here. And also, whenever I do have them, um, a PDF of my keynote presentations, or PowerPoint, or whatever you want to call them, okay? So you should be able to find them there. I've gotten a couple emails about where they are. They're on online. Okay, so um, we were talking about population genetics, and. And we just discussed how uh, random mating by itself doesn't change allele frequencies, so what does? And the forces that, that do uh, change allele frequencies I nicely summarized right here. Those are mutation, selection, genetic drift, and migration. We talked about mutation. Mutation's the ultimate source of variability in populations. It introduces, you know, changes one allele into another allele, right? That's what mutation is. And I just started to talk about selection, so I want to get through the last three forces that cause changes in allele frequencies today. And to understand selection, we have an idea called fitness. Okay? So the fitness of a genotype is assigned to individuals of different genotypes. If the genotypes differ, if individuals di with different genotypes differ in their survival, and or reproduction, the natural selection can see those differences. So natural selection is, is this pro that process that, that, uh, that favors individuals that are more fit, that the ones that have the more favorable genotype. And those alleles that in, will tend to increase in a population through time through the act action of natural selection, okay? Now there's a couple different examples of um, different kinds of natural selection that I wanna talk about. Very nice. Um, one is directional selection. And this is the, the scenario I want you to consider. So here's our little population. It's made up of everybody's homozygous for the little a allele, okay? So we imagine that a mutation uh, hits one of these individuals. So remember, mutations land on one chromosome, initially, on one chromosome and one individual. It changes that little a to be a big A allele, okay? Now, the, the scenario is this. Let's imagine that this, this mutation, this big A allele, is a beneficial mutation. That is to say, it's a good mutation. If you have this allele, you have a fitness advantage over your other individuals in the populations that don't have it. What will happen, what natural selection does, it, it tends to increase the, the frequency of that big A allele. So over time, you would see more and more individuals have the big A allele. Okay, so this might be a snapshot of the population at some intermediate point when the, when the population is polymorphic. That is to say that there's different forms of the allele in the population, okay? Eventually what will happen under the influence of natural selection is everybody has the big A allele. Okay, so eventually everybody has the big A allele and this process of going from a mutation of very low frequency. Initially, what's the frequency of an allele in a population? Can anybody tell me? Uh, let's, let's imagine that the population size is N. That's the number of individuals in the population. What's the initial frequency of a brand new mutation? Okay, well, it's gonna be one over N, but how many chromosomes are in the population? So it's one over two N. This is the number of chromosomes. This is the number of alleles in a population. Initially, only one of them is of the mutant form, right? So all, all mutations start off at this very low frequency. So this, this process of going from a frequency of one over two n to one, that's called the fixate, that this, the allele will, when, once it reaches a, uh, a frequency of one, that, that the allele is said to be fixed, okay? It's said to be fixed in the population when the allele frequency reaches one. And this entire process of mutation plus fixation, that's called the substitution. So if we imagine looking at a DNA sequence, say, 
Initially, you have a mutation that changes maybe a G to a C. If that C eventually reaches a frequency of one, then it becomes fixed in the, in the population. And that entire process of going from mutation and then being fixed is called a substitution. It's not a mutation, it's called a substitution. Mutation is the initial change in one individual's chromosome. Uh, the, the, the substitution is the process of going from that initial low frequency to high frequency. Okay. So anyways, I just wanted to in introduce some terminology, and this is what directional selection tends to do. And th this is a case where the AA individuals are the best, the most fit individuals. These guys are intermediate in fitness, and these guys have the lowest fitness. When you have that situation, then natural selection will favor these two genotypes, and the, the allele, big A allele will uh, increase in frequency in the population. And there's a lot of math that can describe exactly how that transition occurs. So some examples. So in, in humans, there's a number of interesting examples. Um, one involves uh, the ability to digest uh, lactose, okay? So turns out almost all mammals are lactose intolerant as adults. Obviously all mammals, when they're young, when they're first born, they can digest lactose or they wouldn't be alive, right? But through time, as, as, as uh, mammal, m all different mammal species mature, they lose this ability to uh, digest milk as adults. And the reason they do this is there's a gene called the um, LPH gene. This is for um, lactase fluorazine hydrolase, okay? This gene is turned off in adults, okay? Now cats can actually digest milk as adults. Basically, LPH is active or is expressed in adults and cats, okay? So basically there's mutations in cats that cause LPH to be expressed as an adult. It's never turned off. Now there's some, you're probably aware that there's some populations of, of humans that can digest milk. I can do it as an adult, and probably you can raise your hand, can you digest milk? Okay, and you'll probably know it if you can't because you, you're flatulent if you drink too much milk, right? <coughs> there's other things you can tell too, but um, so there's some populations of, 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 uh, of humans that actually can digest milk as adults. It turns out there's two, there's Northern Europeans and some populations in Africa. And interestingly, the, 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 this ability to digest the milk as, a, as an adult is associated with a pastoral life style. That is to say, you, you raise cattle, drink their milk, eat cheese, okay? It's associated with that. And so it's, it's, it's very recent that people have actually discovered the mutations that cause LPH to be constituently active as, as, an, as an adult. So let me show you that. Um, bring the screen down. These are the only two slides I have for this lecture, so. So this is work that just came out a few years ago. And this looks a little bit complicated, so I'll tell you more or less what, this is a figure from a paper that was published in Nature, a few, Nature Genetics a few years ago. But basically this is, a, this is a representation of part of the second chromosome, okay? And then these little uh, hatches are positions where they found uh, variation in humans. That is to say that there's a polymorphism. Some individuals might have a nucleotide T and others might have a C, or some individuals might have the nucleotide A and others might have a G at that position. So these are positions where they're known to be polymorphisms, and this is in this uh, LPH gene region. And what they've done is they've sort of blown up certain regions of this gene, and they found that there were certain, so I should also tell you that there's a, a buzzword that you might want to know, which is called SNP. I think I mentioned it earlier, SNP, for single nucleotide polymorphism. You might actually see that in newspapers. It's a term that's thrown around enough now that I've seen it in, the, in, the, in newspapers. Uh, this basically, SNP is just a place in the human genome where there's variation, okay, a known variation among individuals. But anyways, this is just, they just blown up a certain region of this gene, a, a certain non-coding part of this gene, and they found that there are four mutations, four SNPs, that happen to be associated with this, um, with the gene being active as adults. And here they are, this is the four that they found. There was a GC change here, a CT polymorphism, a TG polymorphism, polymorphism a CT, and a CG. Let's see, which one is, this one right here, the, this one that, that they label 13, 9, 10, this is basically the position along the sequence in this, in this study. This is associated with the ability to digest milk in, in Europeans. And these other three, other three mutations, one, two, three, these three are associated with the ability to digest milk in, uh, in uh, being lactose tolerant, as they say, in adults in, in these African populations. So what this means is that the ability to digest milk in humans has evolved at least 
twice independently, maybe more, right? And you can imagine that natural selection would, would favor this, this, uh, this you know, the ability to digest, digest milk as adults. I mean, this is a huge food source for some groups, of, for some populations of humans, cheese, milk, for instance. Um, and it, it, they can also, using methods that, it, that are, I'm not going to describe in this, in this class, estimate when these mutations probably first occurred about 7,000, 8,000 years ago was the guess that the, the authors put in the paper, which is coincident with when these pastoral uh, lifestyles uh, first were, uh, were adopted. Okay, so this is a, an example in, in humans of, um, of, a, of a recent event of natural selection. And here's just to give you an idea uh, in these African populations, this plot over here shows you these three different countries they, they surveyed and basically, um, they're looking at LP, uh, what is this? Lactose uh, tolerance and intolerance, I believe. So uh, this is just plotting the frequency of these, of these different traits. And over here, they're showing you the frequencies of these different mutations, these different SNPs in the different populations, right? The main, I mean, there's, you're not really responsible for either of these slides. I just wanted to give you an idea of a recent event of natural selection if you basically know the story that there's been multiple events, um, convergent evolution of this trait in two different human populations, I'd be quite happy. And convergent evolution of traits, independent, so convergent evolution is the independent evolution of a trait. That's usually taken as strong evidence that natural selection caused that evolution, okay? If you have, for instance, fusiform uh, forms in, in organisms that swim through the water, that is like a kind of a torpedo shape, you can imagine that's, that's evolved independently in mammals, in whales and dolphins and seals, and also in fish, right? And you can imagine that would be a trait that would be very strongly selected for. Uh, so the, the, so the just to give you an example of some convergent evolution. All right, so let's put this back up, blank the screen, screen up. That's it for this. Oh, no, there's one more time I'll have to bring the screen down up for it. And these past episodes of natural selection, I mean, this is, this is an example of a trait that you might think of as a, as a benefit, and I'm, I'm glad I'm not flatulent after drinking milk, frankly, okay? There's other examples where um, past events of natural selection seem to be associated with what we think of as disease today, okay? So for instance, there's some populations of Native Americans uh, who have a high incidence of type 2 diabetes, incredibly high incidence of type 2 diabetes. And the, a uh, hypothesis that's been used to explain this is that in the past, these populations expressed lots or had experienced lots of starvation or near starvation, so it's selected for individuals that um, could maintain body fat and didn't burn calories very quickly, okay? So it's a so-called thrifty gene hypothesis. Excuse me. Okay, so if you had a thrifty gene, that is to say one that um, made your metabolism slow uh, in the past, you were more likely to, to, su to survive these incidents of, of starvation. But today, in a modern environment where you're, you, know, you can get Twinkies or Ding Dongs from the, the supermarket, we have no shortage of food, this particular, you know, having this genotype uh, is not beneficial. And so these people tend to, you know, have, like I said, a high incidence of type 2 diabetes. And this is one explanation for that in some, some Native American hypothesis, uh, uh, populations. Okay. Now, the next thing I want, so that, that, that's just two examples of balance, of, of uh, directional selection. Basically, this is the type of natural selection that most people think of when they think of, of selection, I believe. But you also have uh, examples of what we might call purifying selection. Okay, and this is an example, so this is the hypothetical example I want you to consider here. So let's imagine a population that's all homozygous for the big A allele now, okay? And you have a mutation uh, that lands on one of these chromosomes in one individual, and it turns that big A allele into a little a allele, okay? In this, in this example, the little a allele isn't advantageous as it was, you know, the mutation is not advantageous or beneficial as it was over here, it's deleterious. This individual's sick. Okay, so what does natural selection do? It tends to remove these alleles from the population. Okay. So one, one question is why would you ever have these alleles floating around in a population? Well, the idea is that you have mutation constantly 
introduces these, these little a alleles into the population, and natural selection is constantly removing these, these mutations from the population. And remember, even though the mutation rate's quite low, you know, you have some, what, 30,000 some odd genes in your genome, so there's always gonna be, you know, every generation you're gonna have a couple deleterious mutations landing on some chromosome somewhere in some individual. And so eventually what'll happen is th there'll be a balance that is struck between natural selection removing these, these deleterious mutations and mutation introducing them. And that, that balance, uh, population geneticists call that uh, mutation uh, selection balance. I'm not going to provide any examples of this, but it, this is just an example of purifying selection, natural selection, continuously trying to remove deleterious mutations from a population. And the last example of natural selection I want to discuss is called balancing selection. And this is the example, the, the, the scenario here is that you have, once again, you have the three different genotypes, big A, big A, big A, little a, and little a, little a. In this scenario, the heterozygous individuals are the most fit, okay? So when the heterozygous individuals are the most fit, then natural selection tends to uh, maintain both alleles in the population. And a good example of this is the sickle cell allele. This, I mean, I, I mentioned in the last lecture that the SS individuals, those that are homozygous for the, um, for the, SS, you know, for the sickle cell uh, allele in the beta globin gene are quite sick individuals, right? They tend to die early. Um, but it turns out that if you're in an area that has malaria, and you're heterozygous, you have a, your, your genotype is the most fit of the three possible genotypes. You're more resistant to the, to the plasmodium um, that actually causes malaria, the, the, the parasite that causes malaria, if you're AS. And in those, in, in malaria is, is, a, is a major killer in the world, I mean, it kills millions of people every year, and so, and it has in the past as well, okay? But this, the, the S allele in many, uh, populations in equatorial regions is, has a frequency as high as 12%, okay, which means about roughly how many, what fraction of individuals are going to be homozygous for S? About 1%, right? 0 0.1 times 0 0.1, roughly. Okay. Now, the natural selection, all, through, all of these scenarios can occur quite quickly, and this is one of the, the major reasons why people turn to math, why mathematicians have actually have a role in, in evolutionary biology. You know, as people, we can only really study populations over the course of a lifetime at most, right? Typically, the, the course of study is at most a decade, right? There's some examples, which maybe I'll get to next week, of, of a couple of scientists who've studied certain populations for 40 some years, or about 40 years now, but that's very infrequent. Usually, the, the time that you can observe a population is about the time of a grant from the government, about four years, okay? which means we can only see snapshots of populations. What the math tells us is that what the frequency, how, how rapidly changes will occur over hundreds of generations, something we, no human can actually study. And so what, what mathematicians found out in the 1920s is that natural selection can see very small differences in the fitness effect among these different genotypes and cause the frequencies to change rapidly over geological or, or even over, over the course of even a human history, like a thousand years. So, th so the, the math has been able to help us predict into the future how quickly alleles should change if the environment stays constant. And that's another thing I should, should point out is that the fitness depends critically on the current environment that the, that the genotype is in. If the environment changes, then the fitness consequences of that, that allele can, can change as well. And a good example of that is uh, phenylketonuria. This is a, a disease that's caused by the inability to break down phenylalanine. All right, and so individuals that have this mutation, they tend to accumulate 
uh, phenylalanine in their body and they, they suffer uh, from mental retardation and they often die quite early. They usually do, in fact. So clearly, that mutation is deleterious in the presence of phenylalanine. If you actually give these people a, a, a diet that doesn't have that, then they're fine. Okay? They can actually live normal lives. They just have to make, be very careful about what they eat because okay? that, that, that mutation is deleterious in the presence of phenylalanine. Okay, is that clear? So the, the, the environment, uh, you know, if the environment changes in some way, then um, the, the fitness advantage of some genotype might appear or disappear or, or might, might become apparent. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about um, selection. Now I want to turn my, my attention to genetic drift. Okay, and genetic drift is um, a random, uh, is sort of the random uh, effects of ch that, that, that change allele frequencies. So you can imagine situations where, um, let's do this. So imagine a situation where big A and little a, their, their fitnesses are equivalent. So th there's no effect of having a big A or a little a mutation at some, in some gene in your, uh, on your fitness, okay? And let's imagine, a, a, an imag let's, let's think of an imaginary population that's 50%, you know, has the big A floating around and then 50% of the alleles are little a. Now, the Hardy-Weinberg theory, which I told you about earlier, says that, well, if that's the case, random mating alone will not change those frequencies. So the, it, the big A and little a frequencies will stay at 50% forever. Right, that's what Hardy-Weinberg says. Turns out in real populations that have finite size, the Hardy-Weinberg theory assumes that the population sizes are very large, or formally speaking, it assumes that they're infinitely large. But in finite size populations, which all po populations on Earth happen to be, the pop one, one of these two alleles will ultimately become fixed. That is to say, one of them will become, you know, the population will eventually become all big A, or it'll eventually become all little a. And we can actually sort of demonstrate the effect of, of genetic drift in a very simple ex experiment. So I'm going to, we're going to demonstrate genetic drift. So I'm going to make um, 10 alleles. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ah, nine, ten. There's our 10 alleles. And let's make um, one, two, three, four. Right, let's make four of them the white alleles, and six will be the, the well, I guess they're green, right? The chalkboard colored alleles. And let's also just label these alleles. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine. Now, I'm not going to explain the, the following statement, but one way of thinking about making, this is our current generation. Let's think about what's gonna, what the population will look like in the next generation. One, one way of simulating genetic drift is just to randomly sample the alleles from the current generation and put them into the next generation. So now we're not thinking about alleles as being in, the, in, the, in individuals, we're just thinking about just randomly selecting these alleles. So we need to have a way of actually selecting randomly among 10 things. And so one thing you could do is you could think about dice. And so I don't know if you're familiar with dice, but most dice have six faces, and, but then we have 10 individuals. I've got a special die here that has 10 faces on it, okay? And, and the faces have the numbers zero through nine on them. Okay, so I don't know if anybody, People here know where these dice come from? Okay, so you're probably, those of you who know where these dice come from kind of realize how grim my social life was in high school, right? <laughs> but, um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna roll these dice, and each roll is gonna determine which allele is sampled and put into the next population. So I'm gonna roll the die 10 times. Actually, one of, I need some help here. I've got two of them. So you're, you're the closest. So you, I'm gonna roll and you roll. Just tell me what numbers you get. I get a six, so allele six goes in, a little seven goes in. Keep going. I got an eight, she got a six. Three, and I got a three. Four, okay. And uh, we need three more rolls. Got a five, six, one more. All right, so the one 
allele which was copied in, that's this color. Six is clear, five is clear, four is clear, three is colored in, three is colored in, six is clear, eight is clear, seven is clear. Is that a zero or a six? I thought it was a six too. Okay, so we have one, two, three of the white alleles, right, in this generation. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Good, we rolled the die the correct number of times. So the frequency of, the, um, of this allele in this population was what? What was the frequency of, the, of that allele? It's 0 0.4, right? What was the frequency of the allele in this generation? 0 0.3, right? Would you all agree that we had no bias in terms of which allele we actually sampled in the previous generation? There's no fitness consequence in terms of you're being more likely to be sampled if you're this allele rather than this allele, right? So the frequencies changed from one generation to another. They evolved, right? But there was no natural selection involved. It was just random chance, okay? So this is genetic drift you can think of as sort of the you know, being hit by the bus type of process in in evolution, right? There is a random factor to, to which um, alleles are gonna be um, ultimately fixed in a population, okay? And, and what I'll do is I'm not gonna you know, show any, once again, I said I'm not gonna show any math, um, but I will show simulations soon uh, that simulate genetic drift and natural selection operating together, okay? Now there's a couple of different terms that come up with, with genetic drift, rather. Um, you can keep that die if you want, it's yours. Yeah. Well, let's use this. It's clean. So there's two different uh, ways that that you often see uh, genetic drift expressed in in in, uh, in evolutionary bio in biology. One is bottlenecks, and what a bottleneck is is a temporary restriction in the population size. So what I'm going to do is make a little graph here where we have time along this axis, there's time, and then on this axis we'll have the population size, n. So you might have a population that's pretty big for a while, and then for whatever reason, the population size decreases, and then maybe later on it re-expands. Okay? So the width here represents the, maybe I should shade it in a bit, the width here represents the population size. And this period right here, that's the bottleneck. That's the restriction in population size. What, what does this mean? It means that genetic drift, so I should also mention that genetic drift is more powerful. It changes the allele frequencies more extremely in small populations than it does in big populations. So when N is small, genetic drift is stronger. When N is big, genetic drift is weaker. So when the population is large during this phase, or for this, during this phase, then sure, the allele, change, the allele frequencies are changing under the influence of, of genetic drift, but they're doing so slowly, right? During these periods when, when the population experiences a bottleneck, then allele frequencies can change very, very rapidly. And in fact, just through the ac action of, of genetic drift alone, alleles can be more likely to be lost during this bottleneck phase than they are here. So bottlenecks often reduce uh, or they, they reduce the genetic uh, variation in the population. In fact, that is a general thing that, that genetic drift does, is it reduces, uh, it removes alleles from a population just by chance. Okay. So genetic drift, more powerful in small populations than in large, it removes variation from a population. And it can remove variation quite quickly when during these bottleneck periods. So that's one, one uh, phenomenon we, you'll see discussed in, uh, in the evolutionary biology literature or population uh, biology literature. And there's examples of, of organisms today that we think um, have experienced bottlenecks in the recent past. For instance, cheetahs. Cheetahs have very little variation, genetic variation from one individual to another. In fact, you can, and you can't do this with humans, you can't take a patch of, of skin from one individual and put it to, you know, it grafted onto another individual without that other individual most likely rejecting that graft, right? You can do that in cheetahs, no problem. They're so, they're so similar, one individual to the next, 
you can actually perform skin grafts and the, the, the individual that has the skin grafted will not reject that. Okay. And so the, the thought is that in some time in the recent past, cheetahs went through a bottleneck and that, that explains why they have so little uh, variation in the population today. The other phenomenon I want to talk about is the founder effect. And this is the idea that, um, let's say, say we have some population, some big population, and it's going to found a new population. So that is to say maybe some individual from this po population or some small number of individuals, what maybe a bird flies to a new island, or maybe some, some individual cross some mountain range, and they, po they found a new population over here. Now the individuals that move from this population, first of all, it's a, the, the idea is it's a small number of individuals, and they're a random sample from the population at large. Okay. So if it happens to be the case that some of these individuals that, that migrated, that founded the new population, happened to have a rare, an allele that was rare in the founding population, then that, that, that allele that is rare over here can be quite common, become quite common over here. Okay. And so often you'll get, like, you're probably familiar with um, these studies of small isolated groups of humans. The, the, uh, there's a lot of, um, um, uh, you know, small populations in, in Pennsylvania, like the Mennonites, um, the Amish, <laughs> that, um, that have high frequencies of some diseases. And it's the thought is that the individual, the, the founding populations of these individuals just happen by chance to have a particular disease, okay? And a good example of this is, um, uh, where's my notes? Here it is. This Huntington's disease. This is in the notes, so I'll just, for brevity's sake, call it HD Huntington's disease, which is a late onset neurodegenerative disease. It's actually a, a very horrible disease. It's not really, I mean, it occurs late in, in life, so after people normally reproduce, so natural selection doesn't see it as well. Um, remember, natural selection's operates on, uh, on individuals before they reproduce, right? Um, so uh, Huntington's the disease can, you know, it's still floating around in the population, but it's at very high frequency in some populations. So there's a population in Venezuela, in the town of San Luis, um, where Huntington's disease is at a very, very high frequency. It's like 25%. And the idea here is that the, the founding population in this, in this particular town the individuals had, you know, had, a, had this particular allele that causes Huntington's disease. This is an, is an example of the founder effect. Okay, now what I want to do now is demonstrate, since I can't, I don't want to do any math, I'm going to demonstrate um, on a with a computer simulation the effects of genetic drift. What, what ha actually happens through time, um, see, when you have just genetic drift going on and just natural selection. So this is, if you're interested, this is a little computer program I wrote um, for the Mac. Um, I, like, I like writing computer programs, as you might have guessed. Um, and so I figured I'd just write a little program here that does this. What I'm going to do is, so these numbers at the bottom, bottom left, don't worry about them. These are, are uh, parameters of these mathematical models that um, allow you to predict the frequencies of alleles at different times, and uh, I'm, they're only there here so I can actually change things. So let's go ahead and um, first of all simulate, um, well, let's go make the frequency of the big A allele 50%. So this is what we talked about with Hardy-Weinberg. All right, so what I did is I made the big A allele frequency 50.5 and the little a allele frequency 0.5, and we all know that Random mating by itself doesn't change the frequency. So if the frequency happens to be 0.5, it stays there forever. If it happens to be 0.1, then it stays there forever, right? Now let's add in, make the population finite. So now we have to tell it how many alleles there are. So let's make 50, 50 of the alleles are gonna be, um, let's make it 100. So you have 100 of the alleles are of the big A type and you have 100 individuals total, so there's 200 alleles in the population. So we're starting, if I did things right here, we're starting the simulation with 50% big A, 50% little a. Let's go ahead and hit the simulate button. So in this case, 
the big A allele one, right? It goes to fixation. This case, uh, it's very convenient, the big A allele is lost, right? Every time I, I push the button here, we're gonna get a different realization of the process, right? It's a random process, it involves rolling dice in the computer memory, essentially. Okay, just like we did here. And of course, the computer does it much more quickly than we do it. But the point here is you see these fluctuations in the allele frequencies, and these fluctuations are caused by nothing more than chance, right? And eventually, the allele frequencies happen to fluctuate to one or they happen to fluctuate to zero, and at that point, either the allele is fixed or it's lost in the population. That's all that genetic drift is. Now let's go ahead and make the population size bigger. Let's make it, instead of 100, make it 10,000. Now let's see what happens. Still have random fluctuations in the allele frequencies, but notice those fluctuations are smaller, right? And in fact, over the course of the simulation, I forget what I actually, what I put as the upper limit, but over the course of the simulation, the allele frequencies don't become fixed or, or lost. Now, eventually, if I were to run the simulation long enough, that would happen. One or, one or the other would win eventually. With probability one, one of those two things will happen. But over the course of the short simulation, um, the allele frequencies changed, was small enough that you didn't see one or the other become fixed. And here's another example, here's another example. Uh, let's make the population a little bit smaller. This is, I, I like doing simulations like this. Uh, this one's lost. That's very exciting. <laughs> All right, but anyways, you get the idea, right? Now, what is the initial frequency of an allele? It's one over two n, right? So let's, this is kind of an unfair situation. We started the two alleles at sort of equal footing, and I'm gonna claim uh, that about 50%, when the, pop, when the frequency, the initial frequency is 50%, about 50% of the time, the big A alleles want wins, and 50% of the time, the little A allele wins, okay? What I'm gonna do now is make the population size a lot smaller. Let's make 10 individuals. And let's start the frequency of, start the frequency of the big A allele to be its initial frequency when it first appears in a population. It always starts off as there being one individual, right? Now what happens? Well, there, it was lost, right? That one individual was hit by a bus or something, right? Here, it was lost again. Here it was lost again, lost, lost, lost. It won, right? There is a chance that it's gonna win occasionally, right? Let's see, lost, 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 wins. Lost, 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 win. Oh, I went for the win. But you get the idea. I'm gonna claim now that the about the fraction of the time that this one wins is about one over two n, okay? The, the probability that a particular allele ultimately is fixed is its frequency at the time you're, you make the prediction, okay? That's one of the, another prediction we can make or another statement we can make about genetic drift. Okay, now that's all, that's all just the two alleles, big A and little a have equal fitness and basically um, here I'm showing the relative fitnesses of the three genotypes and this is just a reminder to myself, frankly, um, but they're all the same, okay? So I know I set things right. Now let's make one of the alleles have an advantage. Okay, let's make it 0.05. This is a, this is a huge fitness advantage for um, being big A. And let's make the population size infinite and let's start the frequency small. So we're gonna just start, so we're just gonna look at what natural selection does just by itself in an infinitely large population. Here we go. It, inc it increases the frequency of the allele. Big surprise, right? So this is, once again, there's no genetic drift. It's, it's like I had two knobs. I have the natural selection knob and I have the genetic drift knob. I turned the genetic drift knob so there was no genetic drift. And then I turned the natural selection knob from there being no fitness difference among the genotypes to there being a fitness difference, right? And in this case, the big A allele, this bi homozygous big A is, is the most fit and the homozygous little a is the least fit and this is the intermediate. So this is an example of directional selection. And it does just what I told you it does. It increases the fitness, I mean, the, the increases the frequency of the big A allele. We can also um, model, the, I put some notes here to myself. We can also model balancing selection. So I'm gonna change this parameter to be minus one now. Now look at the relative fitnesses. This, the balancing selection is the case where the heterozygous individuals are the, uh, are the most fit. And um, 
and what did I say natural selection will do in this case? It's going to maintain both of the alleles in the population, or at least that's what it wants to do. So here we go. We started off at, at a frequency of, of 0 0.01, 1%. I'm doing this wrong. And it goes to some intermediate frequency, and it, and it appears to be staying there forever, right? We could also start the frequency off at some big number, 0 0.99, say, and see what happens. It starts from a big number and goes down. So natural selection is favoring some intermediate frequency for the two alleles. Is that clear? Okay. Now let's go back to the case um, um, I want 0 0.5 here. Let's go back to this case where we have directional selection acting, but this time let's do a finite population. Let's not have, let's, let's, let's turn on both natural selection. So I basically demonstrated natural selection by itself. I demonstrated genetic drift by itself. Let's now combine the two forces, right? What's going to happen? It's very exciting now. So we're going to make the populations finite in size. Let's start the, well, let's start the frequency off kind of intermediate. We'll make 100 individuals, or 100 big alleles and 100. So we're going to start the frequency off at one half, okay? So we're giving, we're starting the frequency off at 50-50, and notice that the population size is kind of small. It's 100 individuals. And that in this case, remember the big A, the big A allele is always favored. If you have a big A, you're always better than if you don't have one. And it increases the frequency to one. Let's push this button a number of times. So fix, 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 fix. Almost lost, but fix, 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 fix. You see a difference in the pattern? Remember when I just had natural, when I just had genetic drift going on, there was no fitness difference among the genotypes, and I did the same thing. What happened? About 50% of the time, roughly 50% of the time, big A was fixed, and roughly 50% of the time, big A was lost, right? Now clearly, we bias the, which, you know, the fraction of the time you're lost. Every time I hit this button, big A was, uh, was fixed, right? We never saw an instance where it was lost. True? Okay, and that makes sense. But now let's go ahead and start the frequency off much smaller. So let's start the frequency of, of the big A allele off at its frequency that it's going to be in when it first occurs. After all, when it first occurs, it's going to be at a frequency. There's only one example of that allele in the population. It's still better. To ha so the individual that mutation lands on is one lucky individual, right? Because it has, he, has a, he or she has a real fitness advantage. But let's see what happens. Will the frequency go off to um, one every time? No, here's one example, there's another example that was lost, right? Here's an, in, it, here's an example of an individual or an allele that's favored being lost from the population, it's not being fixed. Lost, 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 lost. It was fixed there. Lost, lost, every time I push the button, another simulation's occurring. There's another example where it was fixed. This is, this is another example, you know, once, once again, genetic drift is the being hit by a bus. This is an example of that super fit individual just not looking the right way when they cross the street and being hit by the, the bus, right? You know, they're, they're just, they're that, that allele, un those good genes were unfortunately lost in the population. So this is kind of a, a, a remarkable fact and one you might think about. You know, natural selection is definitely a, a powerful force and it does change these allele frequencies, but it's not perfectly efficient. Right? It doesn't take every single beneficial mutation that ever occurs and drag it to fixation. Right? There's this random chance element that natural selection has to fight. So generally speaking, natural selection is more likely, the, the, the alleles are going to be less likely to be lost through um, genetic drift when the populations are large. But the, you're still fighting this, this fact that when, the, when these new beneficial mutations first occur, they're at low frequencies. And so it, it, it basically, natural selection only sort of gains traction when the frequency of this beneficial allele gains some intermediate uh, frequency. Then it's much less likely to be lost and natural selection can do its thing. Okay. Is that clear? No? Yes? Okay, good. Some people are nodding. That's a good sign. All right, so what else did I want to say? All right, so five minutes to go. I don't think there's anything else I can really demonstrate with these um, simulations. Or maybe we could try one last one, which is let's make let's make the heterozygous individuals uh, uh, more fit, and let's see what happens when uh, the populations 
So I'm just doing a bunch of simulations here. Oh, ah, missed it. So I'm pushing the button. You can see how often these, oh, there. So there's an example of balance and selection with genetic drift turned on. So most of the time, once again, I had to push the button many times to, to get an example where the allele wasn't lost. But in this case, the allele isn't lost, but it basically gets to this intermediate frequency, and then it sort of just bounces around, right? It bounces around at that frequency, and it will do that for a very long time. Now, what I'm going to do next, next lecture is uh, finish up my, my discussion of, of um, population genetics with migration, and then I'll give some examples of natural selection in the wild.